Good afternoon and welcome to Wonderful Wednesdays. Thank you so much for joining today. Today, I'm going to focus on sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. And by the way, it happens in 60% of patients who have sepsis and it's very frequently missed. So our focus today will be on just the general understanding of sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy with some cues and clues about when you should be paying attention to the fact that your patient may have cardiac dysfunction, even though they're 18 or 26 or 41, they've never had any coronary disease, but now they have cardiomyopathy, which by the way, in most cases is res resuscitatable and resolvable in about seven to 10 days. So I just want to start with the definition for cardiomyopathy. And I love this definition. I thought it was the greatest one I've ever seen. Published in the European Heart Journal in 2022, cardiomyopathy is defined as structural or functional abnormalities of the ventricular myocardium. And they are unexplained by acute coronary syndrome, basically flow limiting, occlusion, to blood flow in the coronary arteries. And they are also not due to volume overload or profound vasoconstriction. So they're independent from coronary blood flow, from preload and from afterload. And in fact, cardiomyopathy that is sepsis induced is primarily a contractile problem. Now in terms of how this presents my friends, it presents just like other dilated cardiomyopathies. So if you understand cardiomyopathy, you've attended a couple of talks with me, I talk about myocarditis and other issues, you'll feel quite, this will feel quite familiar because it's really not much different except that you can somewhat identify the etiology. So I'm gonna start with our first case. This is a 26 year old female, has a past his history of seizure disorder, well controlled on cisphenitoin. She presents with a 12 hour history of fever, chills, rigors, lower abdominal pain, no uncomfortable urination, no difficulty with urination and no cough, but she is hyperthermic, mildly hyperthermic and tachycardic. But when she is first evaluated, she's got that temperature, she's got tachycardia. Lo and behold, she's hypotensive. So she gets 30 mLs per kg uh, as dictated by the surviving sepsis guidelines. And after two liters of normal saline, because she gets that in the ambulance and one liter in the ambulance and another one when she's in the emergency room, her pressure does respond. It comes up from 75 over 40 to 90 over 50. She has no CV angle tenderness and no other obvious source. The assumption is that she has a, a urinary tract infection because on urinalysis, bacteria is seen and she has five to 20 white, count, uh, white blood cells uh, per distribution. So now when we look at her laboratory analysis, you can see that her white count is one, which means that she's been infected for a period of time. She's had this infection. She's consumed her antibodies and her uh, immature and nonspecific antibodies. And she, I, I said she had consumed her immature ones, but that's not the truth. What she's doing is she's releasing aggressively her immature neutrophils. Those are called bands. Bandemia is an indication of uncontrolled sepsis. And bandemia, remember, are immature neutrophils that are released into the serum because you've consumed the more mature neutrophils. Now, are hemoglobin's normal or platelets are normal, which is a little unusual. Typically, with this degree of, uh, of uh, exacerbation, you would have expected to see that her platelets had dropped, but her platelets right now are normal. And her LFTs are normal, her amylase is normal, her electrolytes are normal, but her creatinine, remember, she's 27. She doesn't really have historic disease that we know of, but um, when we look at her, what we actually see is that her chest x-ray is clear, her CT of chest and abdomen look relatively normal in the lung, but in the abdomen, she's got some free fluid in the pelvis and her left kidney is edematous, which makes us think that she most likely has some kind of obstruction to outflow from the kidney. 
And an echocardiogram is performed amazingly, uh, most particularly because of her hypotension and her tachycardia. The decision is made to do a quick echo and she's got a 67% ejection fraction. So she starts on her empiric antibiotics after the cultures come back. She's got good coverage. She's got uh, coverage for uh, yeast. She's got coverage for uh, broad spectrum for both gram positive and gram negatives. She's looking pretty good. But 12 hours after we see her, her heart rate has now gone up to 180. And it looks like it might be rapid ventricular response with atrial fibrillation. She's significantly decreased her blood pressure down to 65 palpable. And she got a series of more fluids, another 20 mLs per kg. She gets started norepinephrine and vasopressin. But despite that, she continues to be hypotensive. And she's short of breath and her rapid, her respiratory rate is 40. So of course she gets intubated. She's hypoxemic with bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. She gets intubated and on her first blood gas on 80% FiO2, she has a pH of 7.23, PCO2 of 33, and her uh, oxygen level, her dissolved oxygen level is about 78. I can't really remember, and I'm sorry I didn't put it in here. And she also presents with profound metabolic acidosis, and her lactate level is 4.8. Now, transaminases are increasing, and she has diminished her cardiac output, and now she has a prolonged INR, a prolonged clotting time. Now, we didn't see her platelets this time around, but I can guarantee you her platelets have dropped because she is micro-occluding as uh, we often discuss when we talk about sepsis that hyperinflammation causes a stimulation of coagulation cascade. We micro occlude, consume our platelets, and increase our bleeding time because clot dissolution actually uh, stimulates anticoagulation. So now, what are you thinking? You know she's in septic shock. I know you know that. But what else are you thinking about this young 27 year old patient who 12 hours ago had an ejection fraction of 64%. Now, here is the problem, my friends. The problem is yesterday or 12 hours ago, she had an EF of 64%, but she has now deteriorated significantly. And when you see this kind of deterioration, you should always consider a second third, fourth, whatever, in a series echocardiogram. Because with profound sepsis and profound inflammatory mediator release, you can actually see significant myocardial depression. Sometimes we see it and call it myocardial depression factor that actually promotes profound right and left ventricular dilation and significant significantly impacts our patient's ejection fraction. So what you're thinking, and it would be fantastic, you're thinking, oh, she's starting to go into DIC. She's got overwhelming sepsis. The antibiotics aren't working. She's gotten fluid. She's on vasopressors. She's on two vasopressors. We add a third. We put her on epi. She is profoundly hypoxemic. She has ARDS. She has metabolic acidosis. Oh my God, she's going down the tubes and she's really young, younger than a lot of you. So that's really concerning to us and we want to be sure that we are identifying her. So we're going to come back to her in, uh, at the end of the talk. I'm going to give you another case. This is a 49-year-old female who has no former relevant medical history, no regular medication, comes into the ECC reporting flu-like symptoms, of course, she rules out, we rule her out for COVID. We think she probably has the flu. She's weak, she's dizzy, she has headaches and chills. But from the time that she presented with that those symptoms, three days later, she collapses. Her boyfriend calls uh, EMS, EMS arrives and they transport her to the ECC. Even though on EKG, because of course they're gonna do an EKG because she's collapsed, doesn't matter how old or young she is or what her history is, She's collapsed. On her EKG, there is no signs of STEMI. However, she gets a high sensitivity troponin and it's 93,430. Okay, no STEMI, but she has an HS troponin of 93,430. 
So remember that uh, high sensitivity troponin is point of care troponin, which normal would be 0 0.04 times 100. That's what would be normal. Okay, well, this is profoundly abnormal. And we always have to consider, is this an acute presentation or does she have a chronic presentation? And the only way you know if it's acute is you follow that first troponin in one hour with a second troponin because you're looking at rate of rise. If the troponin stays steady or it's starting to go down, this is not an acute event. But if the troponin, which is profoundly elevated and has a rate of rise within one hour, that tells us that the event is acute. Now here's her 12 lead EKG from EMS. And we can certainly see that our patient has an abnormal conduction time and an abnormal conduction configuration. So this is not really a standard EKG. This wasn't performed by our standard EMS. Our great EMS was from another um, organization and they don't have the same methodology of presentation, but it's just one, two, and three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, 2, and 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, the patient has a nonspecific bundle branch block, and she also has some AV block, which is not uncommon to see with a patient who has induced sepsis cardiomyopathy. And look at how her projection is here. Here is her QT. QT is quite prolonged. And she looks like she's in complete heart block. And what happens right here is that the most likelihood is that her P wave fired on the T wave and put her into torsade du point. So that's a form of ventricular tachycardia. And it is often seen in individuals who have AV conduction deficit or who have congenital uh, uh, programs congenital programs that put them at risk for long QT syndrome, or they're taking medications that can prolong their QT. Ha ha, phenytoin, cisphenytoin, sodium channel antagonist, prolongs your QT, puts your patient at risk for amiodarone. On top of the fact that she is an inflammatory, uh, in inflammatory stress. So cardiology is consulted. They take the patient to the cath lab. She's in advanced cardiogenic shock now. She has uh, now in the, um, in the cath lab, they measure that she has a ventricular ejection fraction of 10%. So this is profound, right? She's got a significant decrease in her ejection fraction. She has very poor ejection and very significant increase in her liver enzymes, but no signs of acute myocardial infarction in the EKG. What the heck is going on here? So uh, cardiac power or left side impella is planted. Impella is a device that actually sucks the blood out of the left ventricle and ejects it into the aorta, completely bypassing the left ventricle and left ventricular work. In addition to that, she's placed on inotrope to try to support her native heart, but the impella, similar to a ventricular assist device, it's not a ventricular assist device, nor is it a balloon pump, but it is taking the blood out of the ventricle and shooting it into the aorta. So we're bypassing the left ventricle, not asking the left ventricle to do any work, which was fantastic. It was incredible that they did this that quickly in such a young patient who has no signs of myocardial infarct or STEMI or non-STEMI on her EKG, but who clearly needed LV support perhaps because of her long QT, perhaps her phenytoin levels were high. We didn't know that at the time. So all we knew is that she was septic and that she had a rapid, profound deterioration. Now, over time, her LV systolic function improves. And after eight days of implantation with the impella, she's weaned, that's removed. And six months after on follow-up, her LVF, her left ventricular ejection fraction, has returned to 55%. Now that's what's so remarkable about sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. The majority of patients, if they receive appropriate therapy, which means you're paying attention, diagnostic cues and clues, and if they receive appropriate therapy, the majority of them will recover their myocardial function. So in this way, it's very similar to Takasubo disease, the broken heart syndrome, which can also recover function. 
a lot of the presentation is the same. It's also very similar to myocarditis, although myocarditis tends to have a longer span of ventricular dysfunction. Okay, so in the ECC, there were some really important diagnostic red flags. Well, first of all, we know she's sepsis. She has sepsis, right? And lots of times we, we don't really expect to see this with urosepsis, although we've had two cases in the last year with urosepsis and inducing septic induced cardiomyopathy. It's much more common to actually see sepsis induced cardiomyopathy with upper respiratory uh, tract infections. But here we see with urosepsis, and I have one more patient that we're going to look at who was also with urosepsis. But what we see is a very significant acute coronary decompensation. Happens really fast. The uh, troponin levels go up, but the coronaries are clean. We cannot find a culprit lesion when we go to the cath lab. And these patients typically, their initial presentation isn't shock. They may have very significant abnormal conduction, uh, most particularly looking at long QT syndrome or PR prolongation or heart heart block like we saw in that patient. They also frequently will have veno volume overload. So neck veins are distended. They may have a lot of volume in the abdominal vault with the cites. When we press on the liver, the neck veins distend. That's a positive hepatojugular reflex. They may have hepatomegaly and the liver may actually be pulsing because it's so engorged. We also recognize other signs of shock. The extremities may be cool or cold. They may actually have some acral cyanosis. The pulse pressure tends to be narrow. That's the difference between systole and diastole. Lactate's elevated, the patient's tachycardic. And we're gonna do a whole series of laboratory work for that patient. Don't forget the importance of blood cultures here. It's vitally important to draw blood cultures. Now we're always gonna to try to get blood cultures before we give antibiotics, but if the patient's life is in the balance, antibiotics, rapid administration of antibiotics is the singular most important factor in survival. So we're going to try to get those blood cultures right away. But at one hour, if we haven't gotten our cultures, we may need to just go ahead and give broad spectrum and broad coverage antibiotics. So what you were thinking is, oh, this, you might not have been thinking this exact thing, that this patient's got significant neurologic hormonal changes, high level sympathetic activity, an increased release in renin, which converts to angiotensin, which is a potent vasoconstrictor, aldosterone, which promotes salt and water reabsorption. The patient themselves releasing vasopressin, same kind of effect as renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone. They have inflammatory mediators, most particularly the interleukins. We call this the cascade of inflammation, tumor, necros tumor necrosis factor, most particularly TNF-alpha, and local vasoconstrictors known as endothelin. So we're thinking about that and we are not, probably not in our minds saying, who is this tumor necrosis, fat, tumor necrosis factor alpha? What we're saying is my patient's got refractory hypotension. Now I talk a lot about refractory hypotension because when you have a patient who isn't responding to fluid and vasopressors, you shouldn't just be giving more of the same without saying there is a real problem here. You know, we tend to titrate up and titrate up and we're just trying to get that blood pressure up, but we're not really thinking about what's going on. So I have a patient with refractory hypotension. If they have a central line, I'm going to draw a central venous gas. 50% of people think that's meaningful. The other 50% don't, don't, but I want as much information as I can get. This patient's got refractory hypotension. Um, I'm assuming that when we draw their venous gas, that their SCVO2 is going to be low. They're tachypnic and tachycardic. So this sounds like just about every critical patient you ever see. The thing is, when you're seeing refractory hypotension with tachypnea, tachycardia, and a low SCVO2, you have to actually think that there may be some cardiac failure and it doesn't matter how young they are, you need an echo. Sometimes when I ask for echo, actually my colleagues say, well, she had an echo yesterday. Well, that was then and now it's now. I need another echo.
So even if you're just doing POCUS and just doing a point of care ultrasound, you can get a broad view of what's occurring in the myocardium. You don't have to wait for the echocardiogram, tacticum. It might be in a long line. It might take a really long time. Just try to do a vision or, or to have your provider do a visualization with the POCUS. Okay, remember this patient may be profoundly hypotensive or hypertensive. And typically we're gonna see venous engorgement in the pulmonary vasculature, which is gonna present with breath sound changes, crackles on lung exam, and a, a decrease in saturation requiring an increase in FiO2 and or PEEP. But the biggest thing is you're gonna see those neck veins distended. And if you were able to hear anything, you would hear S3 heart sound and most likely an S4 heart sound. S3, the heart is stiff. S4, the heart is full. Stiff, full, stiff, full, stiff, full. Lup, dup, dup, dup. Oh, let me see if I can do it. Lup, lup, dup, dup. Lup, dup, dup. Lup, dup, dup, dup. Lup, dup, dup, dup. Lup, dup, dup, dup. It's hard to do my mouth and my hands at the same time and keep my mind all together. Okay. So sepsis cardiomyopathy is a major sepsis-induced cardiac dysfunction. And because we see it in all age groups, it tends not to ring a bell to tell you that you need to do an echocardiogram and that you need to evaluate what's occurring with your patient. Frequently, we're gonna see direct myocardial depression. And most particularly, it's an abnormality in the uptake of calcium at the myofibrils and calcium is absolutely 100% essential for myocardial contractility. Now you might say, oh, well then we should just give calcium. No, no, no. You've got to make the cells sensitive to the calcium. And there's really only a few agents that do that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, you will have some impaired blood flow because you have microvascular dysfunction, but these are not macro-occlusive disorders. They're micro-occlusive disorders. That impairs the wall of the vessel, that's the endothelium, and it actually uncouples the relationship between ventricular ejection, bolus of blood out into the artery. We call that ventriculo-arterial uncoupling. We now know that myocardial dysfunction is one of the major predictors of mortality with the mortality rates in patients who have septic induced cardiomyopathy about 70% if we're not recognizing and intervening. So that's really critical because I want you to pay attention. I want you to bring the evidence to your providers. I want you to actually be evaluating the patient and communicating effectively about what's occurring. Now, we, we don't understand everything about myocardial dysfunction in sepsis. We do appreciate that there are specific mediators that depress the myocardial function that alter the way the cells take up uh, ionized calcium for contractility. But we can appreciate that with microvascular coagulation, small, 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 can't, can't stent it, can't do a thrombectomy, it's tiny and it's in the distal surfaces, that we will have some myocardial ischemia eventually. But most particularly, the belief is that this is chemically induced, meaning our own chemicals, are inflammatory mediators, some of which are quite poisonous, like lipopolysaccharide and endotoxin. These are really quite poisonous to the cell. And this is a very complicated uh, process. And what's so interesting about it is as soon as you discover one mediator and block it, all the other mediators heighten and make matters worse. So there's not been a capability to block any of these mediators and actually to improve outcomes for patients. So very important for us to appreciate is what's going to happen is that we have a significant depression of myocardial systolic ejection and diastolic filling dysfunction. And typically, we also are going to see that in conjunction, so left ventricular dysfunction, and in conjunction with right ventricular dysfunction. Now, when we're talking about acute coronary syndromes, typically we see left side or we see right side. Typically, we don't see both ventricles together, although you do see it. It's not rare, but it's not common. Here, when we talk about sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, there's no bias. It affects both right heart 
and left heart, and your patient actually presents with biventricular dysfunction. So I, I love this visual. I, I actually took this from uh, a fantastic article, which I'm happy to share with you, on sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy that just tells us the trio here, direct myocardial suppression, that's the inflammatory mediators that cause myocardial depression. It's also the deregulation or downregulation of the beta receptor sites. So that means when you're given beta stim, you may not see the same kind of response that you would normally. Mitochondrial dysfunction, and that's typically because of overwhelming hypoperfusion, hypoxia at the cellular level. And so you, you uh, actually have a failure of the oxygen metabolism. Um, that's that's actually called oxidative stress. We actually have byproducts from oxygen metabolism that are unstable and that can cause more cellular damage. And then, of course, the impairment of the myocardial circulation in the microcirculation. So not something I'm going to see with a cath, but what I have to understand about sepsis induction, the stimulation of clotting cascade, micro occlusion, consumption of platelets, poor blood flow to the myocardium. So first and foremost, you wanna always remember, you wanna find what the cause is. Now here we're talking about sepsis as an infectious medium, as an infectious trigger, and our highlight of the immune response, which then causes a cascade of inflammatory mediators that then actually end in a deregulation of the myocardium and myocardial dysfunction. So that's really important. You don't have to know the cytokines or memorize the complements or talk about nitric oxide dysfunction. You just need to remember that when we have sepsis, it is highly likely that you're gonna have myocardial depression. And not because you have coronary artery disease, but because that is an outcast from, uh, from hyperstimulation in sepsis. So from that myocardial depression, right, we're looking at what the clinical diagnosis is. So first and foremost, at the bedside, you are recognizing this because your patient is requiring you to titrate up on your vasopressors. Now, if you've been with me on any lecture, anytime, you know I always talk about this. At Grady, we have a wide range of titration that we can perform, but just because we can doesn't mean that we should do so without thought and without communication. So, you know, I'm sure you all know that, uh, that the Joint Commission actually put into ruling some rigorous structures about nurses titrating vasopressors. And by the way, I don't like that. I think we need to have control over vasopressors, but I understand why they did it because what ha has been happening worldwide is we're titrating up when our patients are hypotensive without actually saying, why isn't this patient responding to the vasopressor? What could be wrong with this picture? And what I want you to remember is as you're titrating up on vasopressors, in the pursuit of amine arterial pressure, you need to be asking the question, does my patient have induced cardiac dysfunction? And in this case, it's sepsis-induced cardiac dysfunction. You have to look at a transthoracic echo or transesophageal echo. You're not going to do that, but you need to be asking for it. I'm concerned, doctor, the patient has refractory hypotension that he may have a cardiac component. Can we get an echo? Can you come do a POCUS? I'm going to stay all over you really nicely, but all over you until you come and take a look at this patient's heart, because that is going to then determine how we're going to manage our patient. Now, we're always going to give judicious fluids. We'd like to have an endpoint. We're going to put the patient on vasopressor, but we may now add in a calcium sensitizer. That would be levocimetidine. And I don't think that most of us are using that, so it may not be available to us, but we do have dobutamine, we do have milrinone, and we do have mechanical circulatory support. So Impella, VAD, but most importantly, VA ECMO. VA ECMO is going to be the saving grace for this patient if they don't respond to basic pharmaceutical therapy. So again, patient's going to have decreased ejection fraction. Now, if you're lucky enough to have an A-line with the flow track, you're not monitoring the cardiac output, you're monitoring the stroke volume because the patient may have tachycardia and a really stroke, low stroke volume, 
And they may keep their cardiac output looking normal because cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. But what's been affected here is that their stroke volume is low and they have a compensatory tachycardia to maintain the cardiac output, but it's completely inefficient. You can see both sides of the ventricular surface is dilated. Patient has RV dysfunction. Again, lots of things that we can use to diagnose that. We can look at your CVP. We can look at the CVP waveform things that we're really not talking about here today. Happy to do it. We've talked about it before, but on echocardiogram, what we're actually going to look at is the ratio of dilation of the right ventricle to the left ventricle. We're also going to see that you have left ventricular dysfunction. So here's the way I remind you to look at LV dysfunction. You gave the patient volume and their stroke volume didn't go up. You put them on vasopressors and their stroke volume stays the same or goes down. You put them on a ninotrope and their stroke volume doesn't go up, they have LV dysfunction. So you're always going to try to look at stroke volume and you're looking at stroke volume in the systemic artery as a reflection of the left ventricle. Now we're also going to use echocardiogram to look at the size, the diameter of the right ventricle, the diameter of the left ventricle, the relationship of the wall between that. That's not our job. Our job is to get somebody to the bedside to do an echocardiogram or a POCUS. And if we have an A-line and we have a flow track transducer and an EV1000 or a hemisphere, that's the monitor, I'm going to put a flow track transducer on you and I'm going to monitor your stroke volume. In my hospital, you don't need a doctor's order for that, but you do need a nurse who understands that what they're looking for is an alteration in stroke volume. Stroke volume is a poor man's way of evaluating ejection fraction. Normal stroke volume, 60 to 100 mLs per beat. So I want to remind you the single most important thing you can hear me say here is that when your patient's hemodynamics are unstable, despite fluid, vasopressors, or surgical intervention, they're on antibiotics, they're septic, and they are not resuscitatable or they have refractory hypotension, you need an echocardiogram because sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy when treated appropriately and in a timely manner is reversible in seven to 10 days in general. You have significant and profound biventricular dysfunction. And if all you're doing is throwing more and more vasopressor and more and more volume on that patient, not really paying attention to the contractile component in sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, that may actually um, move them towards mortality and significant morbidity much sooner. So again, this seems to me to be really straightforward. When you have doubled or tripled your vasopressors in 30 minutes to an hour, you have to ask the question, what else is going on here that I can't see with my naked eye? And I don't want to get so bound up and try and get your mean arterial pressure up that I am not seeing what the cause of this problem is. And in a patient who has been actually diagnosed and is being treated for sepsis, the first thing you should think about after vasoplegia, the first thing you have to think about is cardiomyopathy. Okay, on EKG, you're never gonna diagnose cardiomyopathy from an EKG. You gotta have an echo. And on echo, you're gonna have a low EF. You've got increased systolic and diastolic volumes. Both right and left ventricle are dilated. The art, uh, atria are typically also enlarged. And now you might be regurgitating through the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. Very, very important. I need an echo. But what I'm looking at at the bedside is the EKG. And frequently with my EKG, I'm going to see some signs of LV hypertrophy or LA hypertrophy. Those are the most common. It's also very common to see a uh, new onset atrial fibrillation. As the atria gets engorged, you're going to have a lot of stimulation of multifocality. And now the patient's going to be in AFib. So when you came in this morning, they were in a normal sinus rhythm. And now they're in AFib with a rapid ventricular response. That further affects their cardiac ejection and their stroke volume. Oh my gosh, you've got to do something about it because this is a really acute episodic uh, presentation. Now, if we take a look at this patient, what I want you to see here is lots of electrical voltage going to the left. You don't have to be able to read a 12 EDKG. Here's the clear sign. 
I'm in what's known as the standard size EKG. That means 10 boxes equals one millivolt. And you see that here with the standard signal. And most of the time you're doing standard signal EKG. If you can't differentiate where the, the uh, QRS begins and ends on your left side like this, so I can't see the endpoints, see how I have the downward wave, that's the S, and the upward wave, that's the R, and they're merged together. That's a primitive sign that your patient has LV hypertrophy. Okay, now, do I think you should really know how to uh, evaluate it? Yes, I do. But I'm just saying, quick look, EKG, when a normal standard size, that means I haven't turned the size up, I can't differentiate where one QRS begins and the other one ends because they're merged together. And those are on the left side of leads. That would be V4, 5, and 6, where they're merged together. And the QRS is not wide. I'm going to call that LV hypertrophy. LV hypertrophy is matched on the right side with this very significant downward look. So right-sided leads are V1, 2, and 3. This is encompassing the heart, not the limb leads. V1, 2, and 3 are the right-sided leads down, 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 down. And four, five, and six are the left-sided leads, up, 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 up. And in those leads, most particularly left-sided leads, they're merged together. Now, you wouldn't want to say that to a cardiologist, except you could say, if they happen to know Dr. Dollar, who was our chief of cardiology, that's the Dr. Dollar sign. You can't differentiate where one ends and the other begins because they're merged together. That's a sign of ventricular hypertrophy in the left side at least. So that's pretty straightforward. Don't have to have a 12-lead EKG class, although I think everybody should be reading 12-lead EKGs. And I want to remind you, when we looked at our second case there, is that basically she's in class for heart failure or cardiogenic shock when she has sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. So you would like to avoid as much as possible sympathomimetics. Now that would be agents. I mean, that's everything you use for blood pressure, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dobutamine, dopamine. Those are all sympathomimetic. They mimic the sympathetic nervous system. You would like to avoid them as much as you can. You also don't want to block beta stimulation because they already have beta down regulation. So you have to be really aware. If your patient has heart block, you are probably going to need to put them on a temporary pacemaker. And you're going to consider some very low dose dobutamine, even though it's a beta stim, and or match that with a inotropic dilator like milrinone. And then your patient goes to the ICU. And up in the ICU, we should be thinking very quickly for these patients, do they need mechanical circulatory support? And in this case, it would be impella or vent ventricular assist device. And if we're able, we would consider this patient, like our two patients who are young and prior, they're in prior good health, definitely consider them very early on for VA ECMO, not VV, which bypasses the lung. VA, which bypasses the lung and the heart, taking over the operation of the myocardium outside of the body, similar to cardiopulmonary bypass. You don't have ECMO at your hospital? Try to support your patient with what you've got that can give ventricular assistance. Here at my hospital, that would be Impella. Uh, in two years, it will be ECMO, but not VA. It will only be VV to begin with. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at another patient, case number two. This is uh, our, I think is going to be our last case. Uh, in February of 2021, 64-year-old woman was brought into our emergency department. She was brought because her family said she had an alteration in her consciousness. Prior to admission, she'd been febrile. She was experiencing really general fatigue, very unusual for her. Her daughter was with her. Daughter says she vomited three times and it was really a lot of vomit. And her blood pressure is 91 over 60, respiratory rate is 22 breaths per minute. She's somewhat somnolent, and that's new for her. She's usually alert, awake, very interactive. And she meets what we call the Q-SOFA criteria for sepsis. She also meets SIRS criteria, neither of which we actually use today. Now we're going to be using some different sign uh, evaluation, the CDC guideline for identification of sepsis. But at the time, in 2021, we were using Q-SOFA. Okay, so 
Uh, she gets a, uh, an abdominal CT and similar to our first patient or second patient, she has hydronephrosis. Her kidney is quite engorged because she's got a really big ureteral stone. Diagnosed with ureter sepsis, uh, due to that right polynephritis, they take her off to the OR. Her lactate level is 5.8. She goes to the OR. She becomes very unstable and they determine that they don't really want to stabilize her and they send her back out. She's on now on noradrenaline at uh, 0.2 mics per kg per minute. She gets a TE, uh, TTE and the TTE says, hey man, her left ventricle looks great. She's got a left ventricular ejection fraction of 60%. She looks really good, but she's pretty unstable. Her hemodynamics are up and down. Her lactate level is elevated. She's tachycardic. She's tachypnic. So they send her off to the medical ICU and they initiate systemic management. So uh, I was confusing her with our, our patient. This was not our patient. This is another patient. Uh, three hours after surgery, her blood pressure decreases to 49 over 42. So a narrow pulse pressure, very profound drop in her systolic pressure and a drop in her diastolic pressure, even though she's now on norepinephrine, vasopressin and low dose dobutamine. This is her CT scan and you can see here's her ureteral stone. Okay, now in about four hours, the nurse at the bedside said something is wrong. I can't resuscitate the patient. So they do another echocardiogram because she was very persistent. And her second epicardiogram show, uh, uh, echocardiogram shows a decrease from above 60% EF down to 20% with severe diffuse hypokinesis. And we can just take a look. This is not her x-ray, but her heart is very enlarged. This is not her x-ray. You know, this is not a female because they don't have any breasts, but you can see this very large heart. This is an x-ray. Uh, this is actually one of my x-rays from a patient that we had who had sepsis induced cardiomyopathy. So now we're looking at that left ventricular ejection fraction at 20%. She's diagnosed with sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, and they cannulated her and started her on VA ECMO immediately. So really, literally, within eight hours of admission, she's on VA ECMO. She stays on VA ECMO and vasopressors and ventilation, uh, but VA ECMO and vasopressors are discontinued on post-op day three. She's extubated on post-op day four and her left ventricular ejection fraction recovered to even greater than it was before, 71%. Okay, so really important to remember cardiovascular collapse plus indices of sepsis must always be evaluated for sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy always. And we have to work hard for that because there's not really a test except for echocardiogram. So we need a POCUS or we need an echo, we need a TTE, we need a TEE. And what you and I can do is if our patient has an A-line and we have flow track transducers, we'll put the flow track connected to the hemisphere, the EV1000, that's the monitor. And we are going to monitor this patient's stroke volume. Now your doc might say, oh, her cardiac output is 4.2. Yes, but her heart rate is 150 and her stroke volume is 30. Doc, I need to get the stroke volume up and the heart rate down. That's what we really need to do. We need to restore myocardial function because you have sepsis induced cardiomyopathy, and that's going to proliferate in multi organ dysfunction if I am not cautious. Okay. So uh, we looked at this patient earlier, right? This is that case one patient that we started with, right? So I left off right here. When she was deteriorating, I brought to your attention that she was profoundly deteriorating and we were really, really concerned about her and her repeat echo was 15%. 15%, now remember she was about 65% on her first echo, which was just 12 hours earlier. Nobody is interested in doing another echo, but you gotta, you gotta talk about it, ask for it, support it, ask for it again, talk about it again, your patient needs a repeat echo. She did not survive. And this is not her postmortem, but on postmortem, what your expectation will be is to see this very dilated ventricle. 
And that is often what we see post-mortem. So according to uh, ELSO, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization says that VA ECMO should be initiated within six hours of cardiogenic shock. So what you're seeing here is the increasing intensity of intervention by the severity of clinical presentation. And so we start with our therapy that is designed to stop the initiator, the nidus, your antibiotics, your volume. We're going to cut off an offending limb. Whatever is stimulating your inflammatory response, we're going to deliver your baby. We're going to give you fluid. Then we're going to start our norepinephrine. We're going to consider dobutamine in general. We're not going to give beta blocks except in a very, very particular situation. And then we can consider a calcium a calcium sensitizer. And this agent, levosimendin, is an agent that is being used worldwide. It's had some really good small studies and sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. So you might be seeing it uh, start to raise its head or you may already be using it where you were. We are not using it currently here. There are some issues associated with it. It's a very potent agent, so it has to be very carefully utilized. And then we move to VA ECMO. So again, we say, okay, we start off with just, you don't, if you don't have uh, cardiomyopathy or signs of heart failure, we're not gonna treat heart failure. But once we start to see signs of heart failure, we're gonna give you uh, therapy for heart failure and if necessary for pulmonary edema. If you're hypotensive and you have cardiogenic shock, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you IV fluid, we're gonna give you an LVAD or an impella, we're not gonna give you diuretics, we're not gonna give you nitroglycerin, we're not gonna give you a balloon pump. And then we're gonna consider, again, that you really need ventricular assist. So we're gonna consider impella, and then we're gonna consider VA ECMO. Patients oftentimes are gonna have dysrhythmias. We need to be sure that we're monitoring them. We're monitoring their QT interval. We're monitoring their heart block. And we're also gonna consider putting them on prophylactic therapy for thromboembolism because of their sepsis-induced coagulopathies. And then they're gonna leave us on a longer-term management, which is a heart failure management, typically for about three months period of time once they've left the ICU. Just remember this, my friends, a kiss is still a kiss and sepsis induced cardiomyopathy usually resolves within seven to 10 days. If we're doing the right thing, we can help our patients survive. Always suspect it when blood pressure is down, stroke volume is down, SCVO2 is down, that category of three things. Now that looks like cardiogenic shock and guess what? That's because it is cardiogenic shock. The difference is when you get a patient from the cath lab who had a left main 100% occlusion, you expect cardiogenic shock. You don't expect cardiogenic shock when you get a 27-year-old with acute pyelonephritis or a 40-year-old with pneumonia. You're not suspecting or expecting cardiogenic shock. But with sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, that's what it is. So one of the things that's really important is if we put you on low dose to mild dose dobutamine and you increase your cardiac output and your cardiac index and your stroke volume, this actually is a predictor of survival in sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. But you gotta get it on early. You can't be waiting until the patient's gained 16 kilograms and they're almost dead. And now we're gonna try an inotrope. You've got to recognize this early. So just remember the signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock. And we know that patients with sepsis almost always die, almost always die from cardiogenic shock. And that is sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. Clean coronaries, bad disease, you need a great nurse to really evaluate your patient. And to remember that the combination here is that they have dysfunction of ejection and filling, failure of perfusion, and typically there are biomarkers like our patient who had that HS troponin of 92,000. They typically are gonna have elevated biomarkers just like any other coronary disease. I thank you very much. I tried to finish uh, in a timely manner. I hope that you heard something that was meaningful to you because you can go out from here. You can go out and start changing the world. If you are paying good attention to what it is your patient is presenting with and really trying to make 
good recommendations and effective management based on your skills, your knowledge, and the critical analysis of your patient's presentation. Thank you very much. Those of you on the call, please stay on. Otherwise, I'm going to stop my recording. And thank you. I hope I'll see you next week. Remember, I'll be out of the country with um, possibly limitation to internet access. So hopefully we'll be online next Tuesday and Wednesday with a whole different talk. Remember DIC number two. And then I have not yet determined what I'm going to do for wonderful Wednesday's cardiac, but I hope I'll see you then. Thank you very much.